September 3rd, 1965. Two Angleton, Texas sheriffs saw from their car a huge object, 70 meters long, 15 meters high, with a bright violet light at one end and a pale blue light at the other. They stopped to watch it and saw the craft fly within 30 meters, casting a huge shadow when it intercepted the moonlight. They felt a heat wave and drove away in fear, but returned to the site a second time, only to turn around when they found the object was still there. One of the sheriffs had been bitten by an animal before the sighting, and his left index finger swelled and bled freely. But after exposure to the light from the object, the pain was gone, and the wound cured unnaturally. Later that evening, two men found the sheriff at a restaurant and described the object in detail adding that he should keep future encounters to himself. Welcome to Posterity Podcast, a discussion of unusual subjects that touch the lives of everyday people from a Christian worldview. This is Mike Carmen once again sitting alongside Jay Carmen, otherwise known as the Overlords of the UFO. Coming to you from cul-de-sacs in two mysteriously undisclosed locations in Ohio and Tennessee via the internet. How are you, Jay? I'm good. It's a hot, muggy day here in my mysteriously undisclosed location. <laughs> One of these days, we're going to give it all away. We're going to give it all away. That's and right. then our three listeners are going to come after us and get us. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so that's where you two are. <laughs> Mother, <laughs> run for the hills. <laughs> that's right. Oh, that was a really interesting story. A very short it, story, but very interesting. Yeah, it is. And in just a little bit, we'll reveal to our listeners who the author of the the story is, uh, the recorder of the story is, so that we can kind of talk about that a little bit along with some other things uh, as we go into our topic for this evening. It is an interesting story. Not the first case of um, healing from an unidentified flying object. No. Which is bizarre. Very right. bizarre. Yeah. So what are we doing in this episode, Jay? Well, tonight in this episode, we continue our series of conversations on the subject of ufology, which is the study of unidentified flying objects, or in today's vernacular, the unidentified aerial phenomena. In the previous episode, we discussed what we learned from our dad and how our conversations with him over the years have shaped our understanding of the subject and why it still matters to us today. In this episode, we're going to take a brief look at UFOs or just plain old unidentified phenomena in ancient literature, specifically from the book Passport to, Passport to Magonia on UFOs, Folklore, and Parallel Worlds, which was originally published in 1969 and again in 1993 by Dr. Jacques Vallée. So in this episode, we'll discuss stories of aerial phenomena and phenomena which occur on the ground. Jacques yeah. Vallée was... Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, and for the sake of pronunciation, we're going to say valet, even right. though it may be pronounced valet. <laughs> right. Valet. Okay. Right. Sorry about that. Jacques Valley was born. <laughs> no. no, we'll say valet today. Let's see. Jacques Valet was born in France, where he received a BS degree in mathematics at the Sorbonne and an MS in astrophysics at Lille University. Coming to the UNS as an astronomer uh, at the University of Texas, he co-developed the first computer-based map of Mars for NASA. Very impressive achievement. He later moved to Northwestern University, where he received his PhD in computer science. He went on to work at SRI International and at the Institute for the Future, where he directed the project to build the world's first network-based groupware system as a principal investigator on ARPANET, which was the prototype for the internet. A venture capitalist with Euro-America since 1987, Valet has spearheaded early stage investments in over 60 high technology startups. He is a member of the science board for the French Genepole based in every, I know there's a word I have always had trouble saying, looks like <laughs> every, uh, 
uh, and their website is www.genopool.com, specializing in life sciences, and he was elected as a trustee of the Institute for the Future. In May 1955, Valet first sighted an unidentified flying object over his Pointeuse home in France. Six years later, while working on the staff of the French Space Committee, Valet claims to have witnessed the destruction of the tracking tapes of an unknown object orbiting the Earth. The particular object was a retrograde satellite. That is, it's a satellite orbiting the Earth in the opposite direction to the Earth's rotation. At the time he observed this, there were no rockets powerful enough to launch a satellite. So the team was quite excited as they assumed that the Earth's gravity had captured a natural satellite, like an asteroid. He claims that an unnamed superior came and erased the tape. These events contributed to Valet's lifelong interest in the UFO phenomenon. In the mid-1960s, like many other UFO researchers, Valet initially attempted to validate the popular extraterrestrial hypothesis, or ETH. However, by 1969, Valet's conclusions had changed, and he publicly stated that the ETH was too narrow and ignored too much data. Valet began exploring the commonalities between UFOs, cults, religious movements, demons, angels, ghosts, cryptid sightings, and psychic phenomena. His speculation about these potential links was first detailed in this book, Passport to Magonia, which is, of course, our book for today's discussion. He is one of the top prolific writers on the subject. He was the inspiration for the character Claude Lacombe, portrayed by Francois Truffaut in the 1978 Spielberg classic movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Great movie, too. Yeah, yeah, it really was. Yeah. Everything you ever wanted to know about UFOs, you can watch in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, when I when you talk about him and this retrograde satellite tape that was erased one has to wonder how many events in history have been erased because some unknown government agent probably in a black suit walked into a room and said erase that i was never here don't ever talk about this yeah, this did not happen yeah that, that i mean that that in itself is a great story that's a great story yeah and oh, that, I, he carries a lot of uh, credibility with all of this he does. He does. He's he's a very intelligent person. He writes well. He writes very clearly. He's a very strong uh, an- analytical thinker. And this is really a, it's a it's a good book. I have some questions about um, one or two of his sources, but uh, it's a it's a good book. Will we be talking about the first edition or the second tonight? Um, that's a good question. I believe I have. The 1993 edition. Let me look. Yes, I do. Yeah, because he wrote a preface to the 1993 edition. So, yeah, that's the one I've got. Which which one do you have? Uh, I read actually the first edition, but that was years ago, of course. And for our listeners, of course, this was a book that our father had in his stack of literature. He had yeah. one of the first editions, and I read it. Uh, Mike read it. Mike has since reread it in the more modern edition, current edition. So Valet is unique in the sense that he he very soon, very, very soon, in the whole UFO controversy from the 60s, decided that there were links to other things here that went well beyond the extraterrestrial hypothesis, the ETH. And that kind of made him a sort of on his own kind of thinker where some people immediately rejected what he had to say and others were a little more, a little more open at the time. I remember when I read it at the time, uh, it didn't strike. It struck me. It struck me as a little odd because everything else that dad had, anything else that you saw on TV shows at the time, almost always pointed toward, you know, an ET presence, somebody, you know, zipping in from another planet to check us out. Right. You know, drop in, maybe mutilate a few cattle along the way. But that was one of the things that uh, Valet found very odd 
you know, about those kind of behaviors. And I think that was part of what, that was just one of the things, obviously, that led him in a different direction. Which, you know, if, if, if a person is tied to a materialistic worldview, a naturalistic worldview, there is only the natural realm. There is no spirit realm. There are no supernatural works going on. And that's really the logical conclusion that these must be extraterrestrial in nature. And yet he took a look at the characteristics, the broad scope of characteristics, and said, this simply can't all be natural, physical, extraterrestrial, biological. There are just too many characteristics that overlap with what people would think of traditionally as being part of religious experiences. So you have to give him credit for that, that he was willing to change his mind when so many people in light of the evidence are simply not willing to change their minds. So. Right. Talk a little bit about his thesis, if you would. You're much more familiar with this than I am. Yeah, his thesis in, in the front part of the book is that from 1949 to 1960, uh, 1969, there have been numerous reports, and this is what we have. We have numerous reports of craft landing on Earth and then occupants emerging from them. And that these reports have been ignored by the popular press. And as a result, the total phenomena has not really been studied well enough to the point that reports of a like nature from the past, uh, they have also been ignored. So if the broad scope of historical material is taken into account, it can be organized around one central theme, according to Valet. And that is visitation by aerial people from one or more or remote legendary countries. Uh, and I would even add the word realm. And he would say these, you know, legendary countries come under the names of Magonia, which is, of course, part of the title of the book, or the reason for the title of the book. And that is the name of a cloud realm where felonious aerial sailors were said to have come, according to the late bishop Abogard of Lyon in 815. Other names include heaven, hell, elfland, and there are probably many others. And one common characteristic of these reports is we can't get to the places these beings, be they people or monsters, actually claim to come from. They must take us to these realms or places. Now, this reminds me instinctively of when Jesus tells the 12 disciples in John 8, 21, that where he is going to, they can't come. And of course, I'm not at all implying that Jesus' statement about going to heaven is just one or more of a like kind of statement that has been given by creatures or monsters or people throughout the centuries. Uh, I do believe that Jesus' statement is unique, uh, authoritative, and binding. But I do recognize that he said it, and other beings have attempted to make similar claims. His reason for writing the book is to make a bridge between observations and reports from history to the reports of a like nature in the present day. And of course, this is 51 years old. The book was written in 69. Uh, while this book was written all those years ago, it would seem that reports of aerial craft and occupants today would also fit within his work here. In fact, this is why there's actually a second book titled Wonders in the Sky, Unexplained Aerial Objects from Antiquity to Modern Times by Jacques Vallée, and another man by the name of Chris Aubeck. Chris Aubeck did team up with a guy named Martin Show in 2015 to write Return to Magonia, but for the sake of time, uh, we're just going to highlight Passport to Magonia in this episode and you know, on the front end, we're really not going to do justice to the book because the book is, what, 400 pages long? It's or almost 400 pages long. There's a lot. There are a lot of stories in this book that you could spend a lot of time on. So that's basically where he's coming from, which I think is a great thesis. Yeah. And, and so, you know, kind of summing things up, basically, Valet took this position that if you took all the reports from history and the modern reports and compared them, there were a lot of similarities, stories of craft coming from the sky, beings emerging from them, interacting with occupants on the ground, and then those same beings telling us earthlings that, well, you know, we're from such and such a place, 
you can't get there unless we take you. Uh, yeah. Or alluding to that. And in a valet's recounting of these stories from history and from in his present day, which was in the late 60s or mid to late 60s, he defi- or he describes the encounters and then ties those into these other stories from the past where people would talk about, or excuse me, not people, but historians would recount that these beings were from other places, as he said, heaven, hell, Elfland, Magonia, and there were other names associated with that. So yeah, Cleveland, yeah, Ohio. No, I'm sorry. Cleveland. <laughs> No, I just I didn't right say over that. Lake Erie, County Kentucky. No, I didn't say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's a different perspective, and of course, yeah. but he makes a strong argument for the idea that people who don't have encounters with beings coming from a an object or a craft, but instead see lights in the sky, he makes a strong tie between those descriptions of lights in the sky with other visions. Uh, or recounting of events of lights in the sky from the past. So I think it would be accurate to say that he comes to the conclusion that it's not all what it seems to be when it comes to physicality. And as you said, or as we've said before, the extraterrestrial hypothesis, just because it's lights in the sky doesn't have to be aliens. And of course, Mike and I, I think we both maintain that, of course, there are modern sightings and sightings uh, in other parts of the world in recent years where people do see things we've put up there that people have built that other countries have made things like that right there's no doubt about that what he is dealing with and what we're talking about are those descriptions and stories that go well beyond that kind of sighting or encounter so yes and it, it makes me want to go ahead and get into his later works that he produced in the 80s, uh, Messengers of Deception and Dimensions and Confrontations, I think, were some of his other works. Because when you look at the broad scope of the phenomena, there's there are elements that are inherently deceptive about, the, about it. So fascinating stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, today we're going to highlight four different stories for you. And I'm going to take the first one. This is what's known as the Gallipoli Campaign of World War I, which occurred August 28th, 1950. Well, when we think about abduction stories associated with the UFO or alien phenomena, we think of the Betty and Barney Hill story in New Hampshire or Whitley Strieber's uh, chronicled experiences in communion, the book titled Communion. We don't think of low-flying clouds in World War I. But this does bring us up to the Gallipoli. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Gallipoli. Gallipoli yeah, campaign yes. of 1950. Sounds nice that way. It does. And it's yeah. fun to say. Gallipoli. Mm-hmm. Gallipoli. Yeah, I think I'm saying that right. Well, anyway. As World War I raged on, there were battles which took place on the Gallipoli Peninsula in Turkey from 1915 to 1960. The conflict was between Britain, France, and Russia on one side, and the Ottoman Empire on the other. The Ottoman Empire controlled much of southeastern Europe, western Asia, and north Africa from, let's just say, the 14th up into the 20th centuries. Well, without going into the strategic specifics of the last battle of the Gallipoli campaign, the Battle of Hill 60 was significant to Allied victory. So the story goes that on the morning of August 28th, 1915, it started uh, with a clear day, as any day could be on the Mediterranean coast, with the exception of six to eight bread loaf-shaped clouds hovering over Hill 60. Beneath this group of clouds was one of similar shape, but about 800 feet long, 200 feet high, and 200 feet wide, resting above the ground over a dry creek bed. 22 men of the British Number 1 Field Company, overlooking Hill 60, witnessed the 1st 4th Norfolk Regiment 
marching up a creek bed towards Hill 60. Now, thinking that the regiment was there to reinforce British troops, the 22 observers watched the troops march right into the cloud, resting just above the ground. And according to these eyewitnesses, the last of the regiment went into the cloud about an hour later. So it took quite a bit of time to get everybody through and into this cloud layer with no one emerging from the other side. So they go in, but they don't come out. It's like, you know, the Roach Motel, except it's a cloud. So after a while, apparently after everyone entered, the cloud lifted off the ground and joined the other clouds above it. Altogether, the clouds moved north towards Thrace. About 45 minutes later, they were all out of view. And my story continues here as I turn the page. After Turkey surrendered in 1980, in 1918, sorry, after Turkey surrendered in 1918, the British demanded the return of this regiment. But the Turks insisted they never engaged this regiment nor knew of them or of their existence. A British regiment in World War I consisted of about 800 to 4,000 men. And so, you know, the British, hey, they, they demand their troops back, and the Turks say, we never saw them. We never even engaged them. This statement was signed by three of the 22 witnesses at Hill 60, and I won't, I won't give you their names. But this is a cool story. This is the kind of story that you like make a sci-fi movie out of or like a short Twilight Zone episode about, <laughs> you know, right. or something like that, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's a really cool story. And there's no post-history note about this event. We, as far as we know, nobody right. knows what happened to the regiment. So, Yeah, I would love to dig into the history of World War I and find find another account of this because the source in the back of the book for this particular story comes from space view which i believe is a magazine comes from the september october issue of 1965 and i have not been able to find it online like the internet archive or some other place but it is a real periodical and i would love to find it so that i could find the source or sources the author used for this article or chapter, whatever they wrote, because this is just such a great story. I have a great interest in when it comes to biblical theology, Jesus or Yahweh as the cloud rider, as it pertains to temporal days of judgment or the last days or the end times, day of the Lord events. So I think this is just a really interesting story that you know, an entire regiment walks into a cloud and apparently doesn't come out the other side. And, you know, the British don't know what happened to them. So, and what's interesting is, is that, you know, the story is, is given by the British, right? Mm -hmm. It's not right. given by the Turks, you right. know, it'd be one thing if the Turks, 22 Turks came up with this story and then said, sorry, we don't know what happened to your guys, your regiment. But here we saw them march into this cloud and they never came out, which gives the British <laughs> would say, yeah, right. You know, <laughs> exactly. You shot them all dead or, you know, took them prisoner and, you know, you're, you don't want to give them back after the war. But this evidently comes from 22 British soldiers. So, yeah. That's and on the surface, it sounds like just another war ghost story in a sense. But there are some historic there's some historic information behind it. So if you locate the actual history of the regiment, actual right. background, things like that, there are things, in other words, there are things you can look for that tie right. it to history or that do not. And even if it's a made up story, boy, it's a great one, you know, and yeah. in the mind of someone, this is just this. Let, let's tell this one. You know, one, wait till so and so's had a few too many beers, and then we'll <laughs> take him, him the story. But I saw him walk right into that cloud. Yeah, <laughs> he yeah. never came out. <laughs> uh, so again, and this is one of those stories then that, that Valet recounts, and that some people then take that. Well, you know, 
He's just pulling together all this other stuff that has no bearing on modern accounts of UFOs or UAPs uh, far in, in, you know, in the past prior to the publication of the book. And hey, but, you know what? UAPs fly through clouds. Just yeah. saying. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, you know, you got to give, by the way, you got to give, uh, have you ever been someplace like I'm driven in the mountains when it's cloudy yes. and you are driving and you can see the cloud wall and you're just heading up and up and into it. It's like everybody in front of you is slowing down. You can see the lights coming on, the brake lights. Yeah. And it's a creepy experience. We, so. uh, we drove down a mountain in Montana once and there was one part of the mountain that as we were coming down, it was, you know, the mountain was to our left. The cliff was on the right, and there was a, a part of the mountain where it kind of leveled off at at the altitude we were at. And it was actually, you know, I mean, you could you'd actually pull off and get out and walk if you wanted to. And there were these low, low-hanging clouds there, and they were small enough that you could you couldn't see what was on the other side of them, but you could have driven off. You could have pulled off to the side and then just walked over to them and walked right into them. And I thought, what a cool experience that would be. But I thought, nah, I probably ought not to do that. I don't know what's going to happen to me if I walk into these clouds. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Some creepy might happen. Yeah. Or, or is there ground on the other side of that? Thing? <laughs> that's right. Maybe yeah. I'll step into a hole. You know? That's right. Wind up in Sheol. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's another Twilight Zone episode. Okay, yeah. well, anything else from that story we need to talk about? No, it's just a cool story. It is just a cool story. All right, well, let me read. This is a, another uh, recounting that Valet gives in his book uh, about a, an event which took place in Sagrada Familia in uh, Brazil. And... Uh, I'm going to be reading from Passport to Magonia, and, uh, starting on page 113. In late August 1963, near the town of Sagrada Familia, Brazil, three boys, Fernando Eustachio, 11, his brother Ronaldo, who was nine, and a neighbor named Marcos, went into the Eustachio's garden and started to draw water from the well. Suddenly, they became aware of a hovering spear above excuse me, a hovering sphere above the trees. They could even see in that sphere four or five rows of people. An opening under the sphere became visible and two light rays shot downward. A slender 10 foot tall being came down as if gliding on the two beams of light. He alighted in the garden and walked for 20 feet or so in an odd fashion. That is his back seemed stiff his legs were open and his arms were outstretched. He swung his body from left to right as if trying to find his balance and then sat down on a rock. The three boys observed that, giant, observed that the giant wore a transparent helmet and had in the middle of his forehead what they described as a dark eye. He wore tall boots, each of which was equipped with a strange triangular spike which made a peculiar impression in the soft ground and could be seen for several days afterward. His garment was shiny and had inflated as soon as the entity had touched the ground. The trousers seemed to be fastened tightly to the boots. He had a peculiar square pack on his chest, which emitted flashes of light in an intermittent manner. Inside the sphere, still hanging motionless above the garden, the three boys could see occupants behind control panels who were turning knobs and flicking switches. When the giant in the garden made a motion as if to grab one of the boys, Fernando picked up a stone only to find himself unable to do anything with it as the spaceman looked straight into his eyes. The giant then returned to the sphere, still using the light beam as an elevator, but holding his arms close to his body this time. The boys were no longer afraid although they could not account for that new feeling. As the sphere left, they were sure the giant spaceman had not come to hurt them, and somehow in the same irrational fashion, they knew he would come back again. 
in Brazil. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word! You know, and and it, the the story uh, Lale goes on to recount that in Brazil, six years earlier, an incident had taken place that uh, had also gained attention in UFO literature and was written down. So um, this is just kind of an odd story. But evidently recorded as a true story. Now, don't know about the origin. Don't know how much is hoax. Don't know exactly how much is real or exactly how much is, uh, well, whatever. But evidently recorded as a true event that did happen to these boys. And and the giant was said to have come down from the object like riding on rays of light yeah yeah two parallel me well two beams of light that came yeah. down you know it's funny i was listening to the faded discs collection i'm trying to remember the name of the woman who com- compiled all these audio files but the particular section of the collection i was listening to were calls that were made to the National UFO Reporting Center. Yeah, I remember that. that. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to remember his name, Robert Gimble or Grimble. I can't remember, but he would take these calls, and because this is after Project Blue Book closed in '69, and the Condon Report issued their final report, so this National UFO Reporting Center would just take calls, and he actually talked to a couple that experienced a UFO that shot down black beams you know i'd say black beams of light although that's what you would call it but these black beams towards the ground and i don't i don't think they said anything or anyone emerged from the beams or along with them but that's not the first story you know this one here is certainly not the first story of a craft with entities in it shooting down beams, whether they're white or black or any other color. Weird. That is weird. That's an odd one. That is an odd one. Um, You know, when you think about this particular recounting, and I remember, and I have to admit here, I've, I've thought this from time to time, and I've learned to take at least how people recount stories much more seriously. And thinking that when you hear an encounter like this, Recorded by someone who comes from a poorer a poorer place or a place that's a little more backwoods or uh-huh. I don't even think about that. That even in re- the telling of these stories, that sometimes people who recount the story or record the story almost make it appear like there's a certain kind of ignorance there associated. And Valet does not do that with these these tellings. He just no, he doesn't. Writes, he puts it out there the way it is. And I think there's validity to that because it allows the person to tell the story as they encounter, or as they you know went through it or the event as they went through it, recount the story as best that they can. In your own mind, you do with, do with it whatever as far as whether or not you accept it or believe it or you don't. But in that day and in that time, there were lots of stories kind of like that. Yeah, there there was a I listened to a file also today from the National UFO Reporting Center and it was a, a, a young boy that called in. I would say he was probably 10 to 12 years old and he gave an account that he and a friend of his had just a couple of days prior to him making the call. You know, the guy taking the call was he listened very carefully, asked very thoughtful questions and the boy told a very believable story. Uh, couldn't account for, you know, the craft or, or anything else that was along with the experience, but just said, Here, here's what happened. And uh, didn't seem to, you know, embellish or anything on his story. So these things happen. Kids have unusual experiences. Some of them have terrifying experiences, but very unusual. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, one time I was talking to Phil. This is Phil, our brother. We were talking about UFOs, and he stopped. And I'll never forget this because he said someone that he worked for 
once told him he and a couple of his buddies were sitting out on their back deck. And I think they were having a cookout in the evening and it Mm -hmm. was getting dark. And he said that this guy told him very matter of factly that this large craft, this large, uh, I don't know if it was uh, saucer shaped or cylindrical shaped craft (laughs) just floated from outside the scope of their vision. I don't know if it was on the right or the left, but it came into view and he said that the guy told him the darn thing had windows and you could see the aliens inside <laughs> and they just sat there and everybody just sat there and, you know, looked at the, you know, the alleged aliens in the craft and they looked back and he said, they looked like these typical grays. And he said, everybody just, you know, they didn't immediately freak out. They were just completely stunned and they watched this thing just come into their line of vision and then go, out of their line of sight, the other side and just kept going till it went out of view. <laughs> I thought, Holy cow. <laughs> you know, you got to give that guy credit for telling Phil, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Everybody we have, uh, Mike and I have uh, three older half brothers. Our uh, dad had been married before. Phil is the oldest and uh, name, great he probably guy. doesn't want his name mentioned in this podcast. Probably <laughs> not. Probably not. Yeah. So our our oldest brother, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should make up pseudonames for people. Pseudonames, yeah. <laughs> but you're going to give whoever told. I mean, stop and think about it. If I saw something like that, I don't think I'd tell anybody. I might not even tell you. you yeah. know? Well, you know, and to tell the story and to admit you were drinking beer at the time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wasn't drunk, you know. I don't, <laughs> right, I right. probably didn't even bother to say he wasn't drunk. You know, like I, if you think I'm drunk, you're an idiot. You know, this is this is what really happened. So you know, it's probably a tourist craft. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so, fly by here. You can observe Earthlings in their natural habitat. <laughs> yeah, fly flying a banner behind it. You know, eat yeah. at Joe's or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> oh my word. Well, hey, you want to take a commercial break? Have you eaten yet? <laughs> uh, actually, I ate before I came, but I could use something to drink. So we yeah. get something to drink here and come back to this in just a minute. Yeah, let's go pay some bills. All right. We'll be right back. Oh, I love camping outdoors. Ooh, me, Frankenberry, with my delicious strawberry-flavored cereal, Frankenberry. Zip up, Frankenberry. <laughs> I'm here with my delicious chocolate cereal, Count Chocula. <laughs> Count Chocula, the cereal with chocolate marshmallows. Careful, Frankenberry has strawberry flavored marshmallows. Who? Hey, who Who keeps saying who? Me, that's who. (laughs) Enjoy a complete breakfast with Frankenberry. Count Chocula. Atomic war is raging. A handful of surviving humans escape aboard the Battlestar Galactica. They fight their way across the stars in search of a legendary planet known as Earth. Battlestar Galactica, significant you. Did it happen eons ago, or will it happen tomorrow? All over London from Sunday, still at the Empire Leicester Square. New Mr. T, breakfast cereal. The cereal with a dynamite taste presents Mr. T, talk number one. Hello, Mr. T here. And today I'm talking school, getting an education. You just got to help it, kids. So study hard, listen to the teachers, and learn something new every day. You'll be a better person. And remember, do the best you can every day. Mr. T, the delicious, crispy, sweet corn and oat cereal, part of a good breakfast. But remember, you need the whole breakfast to do your best every day. You know, there's nothing better than a bowl of Mr. T cereal. (laughs) (laughs) Don't you just pity the fool that doesn't eat a bowl of cereal that's been around for 35, 40 years? (laughs) Yeah, right. I know a guy who collects cereal boxes and does not open them. And he's been collecting them since he was really young. Yes. Man. Yeah. I wonder if he's got a box of Mr. T cereal. I bet he does. He also knows all the jingles, all the commercials you know a wealth of knowledge if that's what you could call it (laughs) pop culture crunchy pop culture knowledge right Mm -hmm. right exactly 
just pour on the milk and it makes, you know, one part of a delicious and nutritious breakfast. Well, the next story is what I call the curious case of Gary T. Wilcox of Tioga City, New York, April 24th, 1964. I believe this is the same day as the Lonnie Zamora story. Does that sound correct? Uh, Because that's your next story. I I think it is. Yeah, it it is. April 24th, 1964. They both happened the same day. So this is cool. Okay, here we go. Gary Wilcox was a dairy farmer who was spreading fertilizer in his field one day about 10 o'clock in the morning when he went to check on another field about a mile away from his barn. He said that as he appeared, as he approached the field to see if it was ready for plowing, he noticed a shiny object that he thought at first was a refrigerator or part of an aircraft fuselage. And as he approached it, he saw it was an egg-shaped object about 60 to 20 feet in length. He went up to it, evidently wasn't afraid, and he touched the the exterior of the craft. And I don't think, I don't remember if he said it was hot or cold, but he said as soon as he touched the craft, two human-like creatures emerged from it, which were about four feet tall, wearing seamless clothing with hoods that seemed to cover most of their facial features. Wilcox said they spoke in smooth English. Not sure what that means, but it must have been very understandable. And they said that they were from Mars. Well, without really seeing their facial features due to their, these hoods that they were wearing, Wilcox said their voices, however, didn't really seem to come from their heads, but from their bodies which is really creepy. Yeah, yeah. Believing someone to be playing a joke on him, the beings informed him they wished to learn more about agricultural techniques as growing food on Mars was environmentally difficult. Their questions seemed rather childish and appeared to Wilcox as having no real, these guys had no real knowledge of agriculture. They explained to him that they only visited Earth every two years and were only visiting the Northern Hemisphere. But before departing, they explained that humans really could not adapt to living in space and they really shouldn't try to go. It would be a pointless effort. And then they asked him for a bag of fertilizer. (laughs) (laughs) And as Wilcox went to get it, they took off as quickly as they could. Well, Wilcox laughed. He went and got the fertilizer. He put it where the craft had been, and the next day it was gone. Which sounds like a prank in itself, doesn't it? Boy, it does. You know? It does. That's a that's a that's a, a an interesting story. It's kind of a funny story. But one of the things that I think is interesting is, is that I do believe in cases of people that are legitimately possessed sometimes the voices come from their bodies and not necessarily from their mouths so that was one interesting characteristic i carried over to possession it's you know it's these kinds of stories where somebody says they really saw something they just de- they seem to describe it well if they are considered trustworthy people one would have to say you know this kind of a story doesn't really doesn't really seem to go along with the extraterrestrial hypothesis very well mm-hmm. you know yeah. that you would only come to earth every 2 years and only visit the northern hemisphere and your purpose in coming is to talk about agriculture and then run away as quickly as you can it's one of those stories where if this wasn't a trustworthy person, you know, I could see somebody telling this tale to pull somebody's leg. But some UFO stories are so bizarre and are told by people that don't seem to have any interest in pulling anybody's leg, but rather just say, here's what happened to me. Take it or leave it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to go ahead and tie my name to it. I don't think those people have... Uh, you know, are trying to pull the wool over somebody's eyes. So this is an interesting story. I'm not really sure 
what to do with it, but it's interesting. Well, and, you know, it, it is one of those stories then that leads people to conclude that, well, this is all just a, a lot of hooey because it's so that kind of a story is very much tied to how science fiction stories and movies addressed issues in the 50s, especially, you know, in the 60s. So there are these aspects of, you know, science fiction writers who some were making legitimate efforts to draw, to make a parallel, to, to infer certain about, they use science fiction as a vehicle to tell stories about modern times or to address social issues. Uh, right. Of course, if you, if you watch a lot of the documentaries, or not a lot, but if you watch a good documentary about the script writers for shows like uh, Star Trek, where the writers themselves admit, yeah, we were using this story as a way to deal with a current political or social problem, but you place the story within a different context, set in the future, out on another planet, out in space or whatever, it allows you to tell that story and make a point. Well, there are some UFO stories, and by stories I mean people recounting things that happened to them that almost have that same vibe about them. Hmm. Uh, people who tell stories of beings who have come to watch the earth and save us from ourselves. People who tell stories of, you know, well, and, and I'm not saying that the person isn't telling the truth. Something happened to that person. They're just recounting what happened. If, if you've ever watched any of Stephen Greer, uh, D- Dr. Stephen Greer of the Disclosure Project, if mm-hmm. you've watched any of his recent documentaries in the last few years on Amazon.com, one of the things that he asserts is that in his effort to, in the efforts of his followers to contact, you know, space entities, space brothers, what they have learned is that these space entities or whatever he calls them, they have a sincere interest in helping us avoid climate change, global warming, nuclear mm-hmm. war, things of that nature. And after reading the story, I thought if you were to take the broad scope of stories about UFOs and aliens and spaceships and crafts and landings and all this stuff, if you were to take all of these stories where there's a concern for the earth or learning things about the earth, how many of those stories or what percentage of them would be completely nonsensical would make no sense whatsoever. But yet some of those stories are the basis for his interest in being pro environment and getting that message out there that this is what the aliens are trying to teach us, right? They're, they're always trying to teach us through a kind of a message that isn't straightforward and direct and coherent, I think, at least isn't consistent from one alien or one group of aliens to the other. It's this messy mashup of stories that we're supposed to figure out, oh, we're supposed to go care for the environment, you know. So anyway, just food for thought, because I I just find this story interesting, but yet as one of the many UFO alien stories about the environment, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> Right, right. And yet that's not to say that the person who has the experience isn't being sincere in what they right. are saying happened, you know. Yeah. There are, there are definitely some things that, that really kind of freak people out freak people out. And there are there are people, sure, that make things up, but or that are just interested in creating some kind of uh, false narrative. But then there's the person who literally gets the pants scared off of them because of something that happens to them. Yeah. And what do you do with that? Yeah. <laughs> what do you do with the guys who are having the cookout, you know, and, <laughs> and the tourists go by. So, you know, <laughs> well, what do you do with that kind of? A, that well, you thing? know, I, I can give, uh, I respect people who look you straight in the eye and will say, I don't care if you believe me, mm-hmm. this is what happened. Right. You know, and if you don't believe me, that's fine. I can respect that. Yeah. I have, a, you know, 
my inclination is to is to believe that those people are are telling the truth. Right. Yeah. Telling the truth and experience of the truth are not the same thing. Right. And you know, kind of taking that and going into our next story, Valet does cover well documented stories uh, accounts as well. He summarizes them and and deals with them also. Uh, of course, he's addressing a particular type of thesis. But in doing so, he takes the stories that have always had a bit more credibility behind them. One of those is the story of uh, Lonnie Zamora. On page 39, he talks about this landing that Lonnie Zamora, who was a police officer, had and in this Socorro, New Mexico, where this officer Zamora observed an egg-shaped, shiny object land on the ground. And he gets close enough to it, and this is from the, uh, the appendix here, and on, also on page 297 of his book. The officer gets close enough to observe that the white craft, this egg-shaped craft, rested on four legs, and it was in sitting in a depression about four kilometers outside of Zocoro. Standing near the object were two figures who were below average height, and they were dressed in white. Uh, within uh, 30 meters of the object, he also saw, getting close enough, getting that close to it, 30 meters of the object, he could see that the object had a red insignia on its aluminum-like surface, and the figures get back inside, the fig, uh, ship or whatever it is goes up to about four meters with a strong roar like a rocket engine almost and then it becomes very silent it hovers and then it just flies away when he recounts this story zamora is just very matter of fact about it mm -hmm. this is what i saw and the story made national news because he was a police officer he was a very well respected police officer yeah he was and you know nobody really ever there have been theories that have been offered as to what it was that he encountered but and and some who would probably say oh, i just made it up or it's just crazy but for the most part it was treated as a very matter of fact kind of incident mm -hmm. it is one of those stories that uh, and news accounts and however you want to think about that it is one of those stories that led a lot of people a lot of readers to take the issue a bit more seriously so that there was at least some, let's say, uh, allowance for respected people who tell unusual stories and to say, okay, I, I believe that you were describing exactly what you saw. I don't know what it was. Right. Yeah. Lon Lonnie Zamora's story is, um, you know, I don't, I don't think he had anything to, to gain. No, telling that story i really didn't and by the way that happened in uh as mike said earlier it happened in april of 1964 happened the same day as the gary wilcox account uh which mike covered from uh, teoga city new york you know I, I i don't think that he had anything personally to gain by telling that story as i said and if i if i remember correctly he gets enough abuse from telling that story from, from the public that he winds up quitting his job after a while. Yeah. I uh, stops that. being a police officer and goes into another line of work. I don't remember exactly what that was, but that's a, that's kind of a rough road to go. Right. And it does make you question, you know, what do you really do when you experience something that's so, out of the ordinary and bizarre, and you're in a vocation where you're required to report what's going on in your environment and what you're doing with your time, or, or I guess you could get in trouble, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, but. Uh, Which actually that brings to mind, you mentioned, uh, we, we mentioned Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, if you remember, at the start of the movie. You're in a, it's, isn't that, it's in a control tower of an airport and they're getting airline pilots who are calling in air traffic and saying right. something unusual. And finally, the uh, air traffic controller in charge says, flight so-and-so and so-and-so, do you want to report a UFO? 
And right. Silence. Yeah. And then the voice on the other end of the microphone says, no, I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and then the officer, the traffic controller in charge says to the other flight, flight so-and-so, do you want to report a UFO? And you hear this very different voice go, no, we don't want to do that either. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and folks, that is still how people think about this. Yeah. I, years ago in a church I was with, I, I taught a class on, um, uh, was it Theology of Cults? And I took a night or two and covered the UFO phenomena. And I used that as the introduction to the subject. And after I showed that very clip, I, I turned the projector off and I said, has anyone ever seen a UFO? And about a half a dozen people said, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you don't. You know? Yeah, right. Exactly. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because in his story, he talks about uh, pursuing a speeding car uh, south of Socorro when he said he heard a roar and saw a flame in the sky to the southwest some distance away. And if I understand the story correctly, he basically let the car go to go in pursuit of this object. <laughs> and I bet that's one of those defining moments where he wishes, oh, I wish I just stayed with that speeding car. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I wish I'd just tracked that sucker down and given him a ticket. Didn't, didn't he? <laughs> right. Didn't he think he, he thought it was a uh, a plane going to crash or something? He thought it was something. He thought it was something pretty normal and mundane, and then he gets in there. Yeah. It's not. It, you know, I think there was like the possibility of a local dynamite shack maybe having exploded. And so he, you know, can, he pursues this thing to investigate a potential explosion right. and, you know, discovers the shiny object and uh, uh, kind of aluminum colored, it's aluminum color in appearance. And then these two people in white coveralls coming out. Checking the oh. oil. <laughs> Checking the oil, yeah. <laughs> and then he says, you know, he hears a roar and sees a blue and orange flame under the object. You know, when you consider the all UFO reports of craft that land, you know, I wonder what percentage of them actually report fire or thrust uh, under the actual craft or out mm -hmm. the side or something like that. It doesn't, but great story. The, the Lonnie's a more story. It's been on unsolved mysteries. Uh, been on several programs. So. Well, that's all for this episode of posterity podcast. If you'd like to listen to our analysis of these four stories from Passport to Magonia by Dr. Jacques Vallée, just click on the link to the next episode. Thanks for joining us.